Hey, it's John. I am here to answer your questions. All right, looks like we already have some. So great, great. Welcome, Peggy. Uh, Aaron, welcome. Welcome. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, as usual, put your questions in the chat. Um, I will get to everyone. Uh, let's see. Peggy, I'd be interested in pro tips for maintaining vocal health in terms of diet, supplements, concoction sprays for clearing phlegm and exercise. So this is something that I'm quite familiar with these days. Um, again, I like to use a, a nebulizer. This is filled with saline solution. People will ask for the link. You know what? This is just one I got on Amazon. I think it was like they're around 40 bucks. There are more expensive ones. I haven't found them to work any better. Um, I think your choice is if you want to use battery powered or if it's a one you can charge. If you get the battery powered one where you have to put in batteries, I would just use the um, USB charger. I mean, um, plug because it goes through batteries way too quick. The other thing that I do is I use for phlegm. Um, there is something called guafenesin, and I think it's, look, if you misspell it on Amazon, you'll find it. I believe it's G-U-A-F-I-N, guafenesin, guafenesin, um, just type that in and you should come up with something. Um, but with guafenesin, what it is, is it's actually in, it's the active ingredient that's in things such as mucinex, but it's just the pure active ingredient. It is originally, it's a um, extract from tree bark. I believe they synthesize it now. It's very inexpensive uh, to get on as a generic. And what it does is it cuts through phlegm and it, it, it helps uh, thin that out. I take it every day. Check with your doctor. My research, I, I don't believe that there's an issue with taking one daily, but again, I'm not a doctor, so please check with your doctor before you're taking uh, medications. But um, that's a really good one. Diet, I would have your diet make sure that you are incorporating water-rich foods, fruits and vegetables, uh, soups. Uh, things of that nature, just to really keep your body hydrated. There's also lots of um, amazing phytochemicals, things that we're still discovering that are found in natural foods. So basically, avoiding processed foods as much as possible. I know here in the United States, and we've started to export our diet, it, it's just incredibly unhealthy. Um, it's, it, it's very palatable food. I mean, it's incredibly tasty. Sure, nachos taste wonderful. Um, and potato chips and cheeseburgers and all those things. But it's just, it's not the best thing for your body. Getting cardiovascular exercise daily, uh, walks are something that you can do. Here's something that I've caught myself doing, and it's a mistake, is I will go on a walk, and the walk is usually, I'll, I'll walk up through the hills, and um, it's about an hour or so. And on days where I'm really busy, I think, oh, I don't have an hour and I don't do it. And that's a mistake because even just 10 minutes, just get out for 10 minutes and take a brisk walk. Everyone has time for that. That is that is key. Also, vocalizing every day. Again, you don't have to vocalize for 45 minutes. It can be 10, 15 minutes. Um, but just just keep working that. You know the old use it or lose it. Keep doing things to stretch the voice, um, even just light things, even like, you know, tongue trills, lip bubbles, just so you can, ooh, just glides, things like that. Keep everything really, really uh, supple and limber. Um, those are my best approaches. Um, there's also, oh, what is... I, I do take um, B12 supplements for myself. And there, oh, there's another supplement I take. It's a spray for the voice, and I'm completely blanking out on it. But um, 
Uh, you know what? You ask me in um, voice school. I know you're a member, Peggy. Uh, just just get on the form and ask me for that that spray supplement, and I will I will get it for you. I have found some 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 help with that. You know, just just general health. It, your body's health is reflected in your in your vocal health. Uh, let me see. How can a student improve their stage performance and confidence on stage other than just performing more? Well, yeah, I mean, that is that is the main answer, right? Is as as has been said, the way around is through. And it's really just spending time just in performance. When we had um, when I had a music academy, a brick and mortar, we built a stage room and we built a stage just to get students up there. And it's amazing. They can be in their lesson. And then we take them into the stage room and uh oh, it's completely different. And the stage was only like 12 inches high, but it completely just changed their their point of view. So it's it's just getting students. If, if when you're teaching in your teaching studio, you can do a setup where you have maybe a, a, a small karaoke system where now they're on the mic, make them stand somewhere different. Maybe you can um, turn down the lights and just to, and just put them in a performance mode. Anything that changes, that's a pattern interrupt from lessons, lessons can tend to fall into patterns, right? And okay, I warm up, now I work on my scales, now I work on my song. So setting time aside, even if it's just in your studio where now we are in performance mode, I'm not gonna interrupt you. I am now the audience, you become the audience. Tell the student you're the audience and have them work things even just where to look because students will get nervous they don't know what to do with their eyes and their eyes dart around nervously um and what i tell them is and you can do this with just you sitting there i tell them you know what there's a movie playing just above my head and this movie is about the song it's about your feelings in the song so however you connect to this song whether this is a song you're singing to your dog. I want you to watch this movie of your dog right projected on the back wall just above my head. And what that does is that gives their eyes focus and it makes their eyes alive rather than them doing this. And then I tell them, okay, when we come to the next verse, look at the movie over here. And then they keep going. Now you come to the chorus and you're going to take one step forward and you're going to come back the movies now to the center. And then the movie changes over to this side. And what it does is it's teaching them to project their energy and the audience needs to be able to be a voyeur. They need to be able to watch without feeling uncomfortable. It's the worst thing if someone's just staring at them. And not that they can't make eye contact, but you make brief eye contact and back to this movie. But just keep putting them, break those patterns, put them in situations where they feel like they're performing. Um, Dizzy Lizzy, I am familiar with Catherine Sadelin. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's an incredibly interesting approach to the voice, and I think you know back going way way back in my days, and I was um, in speech level singing way way back, and so there was some antagonistic uh, feelings between the two groups, or at least that was my perception of it, and. Um, now that a SLS doesn't really exist anymore and I've, I've moved on in my vocal technique, uh, or just, just opened my eyes to other approaches. I think she has some uh, wonderful approaches and, and certainly, uh, giving people more colors to work with, uh, more tools and colors in their, in their palette. Um, Guafanesen, thank you, Lee. Absolutely. What is the quickest, most effective way to warm up your voice? Um, this is obviously debatable, but most would, most would answer the straw. Utilizing a voice straw is, can warm your voice up uh, rather quickly. There are different variations of the voice straw. There's just the straw alone, and these come in different sizes. Um, there is also 
a version of the straw where you fill it with water so the water creates the resistance. There are straws with cups. And the idea behind this is this is going to create back pressure. And this back pressure is going to help your vocal cords come and approximate, line up correctly. It's almost like a little chiropractic adjustment for your vocal cords. So if you're having trouble, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This can help you find the right place. So people argue that's the most effective way. Um, in terms of warming up, recent research, five to 10 minutes is all that's really, really needed. Um, there are different things you can do, usually lighter sounds. Um, you know, if you don't have a straw, you can put some resistance at your lips. You can use the tongue trills, lip bubbles. I also like really light sounds. And just feel yourself, right? That light sound is going to approximate the vocal folds, but you're also going to be able to make that, that acoustic transition into your upper register. It's relatively easy. And then you can start to add just a little more edge. So you start connecting it, putting it together. Um, but yeah, that's if, if I'm in a pinch and I need to warm up my voice really, really quickly, I go to the straw. That, that's my go-to. Let me see. Um, in which situations would you recommend using LMN for singers rather than APN to create more twang? Also, which parts of the voice? Does this mainly depend on the sound the singer wants? Yeah. So the <clears throat> this LMN, APN, obviously you are um, familiar with Carrie Obert's work, which, which I uh, recommend to everyone, K-E-R-R-I-E. Carrie Obert, she's done a lot of study on this. So LMN, it's basically lateral to medial narrowing. So lateral, medial narrowing. This is something that the vocal tract does. This is something the throat does, the upper part of the throat, um, usually when we're singing higher. And this, this narrowing, and this is the sides narrowing, all right? And what it does, if you look at a pipe organ, you can see which pipes are for higher notes and which pipes are for lower notes, right? They get, they get shorter, but they also get thinner. So this helps create this, this thinning and this narrowing. And when it's done correctly, it's not compressing at the vocal cords, right? It's almost more of a pyramid. So this is more of, in my understanding of Carrie's work and, and how I use it, I, I do not have the experience of looking at 20,000, over 20,000 endoscopies. But this, the sides coming in, this is kind of more of the twang. The APN, that's an, um, anterior posterior. So what it is, it's the tongue. So the way that you can narrow the throat is the sides will narrow or see the back is is not going to move. The sides can move or your, the back of the tongue can move and create this narrowing this way. So you have side to side and you have front to back. The front to back narrowing is also part of it. That can be a little more associated with a slightly darker sound. Hey, as opposed to hey, uh, but they're, they're both highly effective. This is why you want to do exercises that are going to strengthen this. You can do the little twangy exercises that are going to bring uh, the sides together. And then there's also when you can bring the, the back of the tongue. The back of the tongue, again, it just it kind of warms up, whereas that makes things a little brighter. But again, we can't 
we can't cleanly delineate the parts of the voice because everything affects everything. Um, but that that's the general. So what I will do is I will have people work that attitude of twang that will create this. And then what I'll do is I'll have them in the tongue. I'll kind of get them to activate the tongue more in a, kind of this attitude of, of, a, of a crouching tiger. He, hey, hey. And this attitude will also help bring back this, this front to back narrowing. It will help activate that as well. So if somebody is, hey, hey, they're having trouble, this, and you can also do a cat hiss. Hey, yeah. Right? It, it, it starts to get that bite in there. Yeah! And I can move the tongue to find the right place. Yeah! yeah! Without that, yeah! I can't reach it. So it's, it's playing with that. Um, there's also exercises I get from Carrie doing things like so you do one bright e, and then you work the back to front narrow or front to back e, 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 e. and so you're playing you're developing um that coordination so it can be um that can be very helpful but it sounds like uh you've done some really really good study so in terms of yeah i work I work both and I don't want it to be something for the singer where they feel like they're, they're having to make these big moves. It's one or the other. You just, you work everything and then they just, they just kind of think color and intention and attitude and, and let that come through. And that will run more uh, below the surface unless it's something they're specifically working on. What is my go-to breath support exercise that works for the majority of vocal students so what i want to do um the exercise i want to connect them to their breath and i want them to connect to the feeling of taking in a nice breath that's not too much if we take in too much what we do is we over inflate the lungs and they have a certain amount of elastic recoil so if they're over inflated they're going to push, push that air out very quickly so I have them just get this feeling of a noble posture. The, the chest is slightly lifted. The ribs are expanded. So all of this is open. And then the breath drops into the belly. And they can just feel that. And I'll have them place their fingers a couple of inches below the belly button and have them focus there, feel that expand. And then I'll have them do a little uh, tiny cough and feel that little muscle kick out in this hypogastric area. And then have them just do little hisses where they feel that kick and then hiss on a sustained where they're pressing out. All of this stays open. What we don't want is the, is the collapse. Then from there, they can move to hey, hey, ho, ho, ha, ha, little hey, hey. And the idea is they're not feeling it crunch, crunch, squeeze, squeeze. It's the focus is here. S -s -s hey, hey, ha, ho, ha, ha. And then that starts to connect s -s -s with the breath. Now, there's the debate whether we should press out for support. Should we pull in, allow the stomach to pull in? There's, there's no evidence that one is superior to the other. Um, Carrie Obert again, I've had discussions with her and um, it appears they're both valid. The press out seems to be better for longer sustained lines. If you're really going to belt something, the pull in, be careful of the pull in because that can, <laughs> that can cause some tightening, right? But you can start to experiment with <laughs> and then pull the tummy in and get them both working. Hello, Stewie. Do you know where I can buy straws for straw exercises? When is the best time to do it and use it? 
So, Jeremy, you can get them on at uh, so voicedraw.com um, is done by a friend of mine, Mindy Peck. What I like about her voice straws, when you get it, you get a three different sizes. So you get the drink straw size, you get the little cocktail straw size. She has has worked in conjunction with Dr. Ingo Tietze, who developed these exercises to get the right diameters and lengths, et cetera. But then she also has these silicon cups. And what I like about these is you can start to move into singing. Yeah, 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 yeah. While, while having the resistance of the cup and, and there's different diameters as well. So I recommend those. This one I also like, this is Dr. Vox, V-O-X. Um, another friend of mine, Jamie Vendera, is involved with this. I like this as well. Um, you can also use drink straws in a pinch. The bigger size drink straw, more this size. Um, you may need to use a little more resistance. <laughs> Just what you want to feel is a, you don't want to be struggling, but you don't want it to be too easy either. So by me placing my finger here, I get that little feeling of a bullfrog throat and I allow my cheeks to puff up a little bit. You can also put these into water. Water is going to increase the resistance. And the more, the deeper you put it in the water, the more the resistance. So you play with that. You kind of get this feeling of equilibrium. When should you do it? And let me see, what is the, oops, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me go back. When's the best time to do it and when to use it? Throughout the day. I also um, have a little straw that, that's on a chain that, that um, works really well. I, or you just keep them. You just keep them in your pocket. I've got uh, little silicon versions. Just anything that's gonna mm, provide that resistance. You don't have to have the exact straw. And in a pinch, again, mm, do it all the time. Do it while you're driving. You know, if you've got to go in to um, have the have the straws there while you're doing your practicing. Just 30, 60, 90 seconds of this is really, really going to be helpful. And you can just do things like glides, pulses, little, little scales. All of them just give resistance. Sing little songs through it, happy birthday, etc. cetera. But it's, it's incredibly helpful. So I do them all the time. You're welcome, Tristan. Let me see. Guro, uh, loving your approach on mix. Thank you. But being a Norwegian singing teacher, the us setting is difficult to find in our language. What other tricks, images, audio examples of certain artists could I use? Yeah, this is interesting. Um, the uh and uh are not found in every language. And they're and they're even in English, there are there are certain dialects that really don't have the uh or uh. What you can do is if you're having trouble with, with a vowel sound, all vowels are is a tuning of the vocal tract. So if somebody just takes in a deep, relaxed breath and just phonates on the exhale, uh, uh, almost like a yawn, uh, let them feel that, right? And it's just the position of the larynx. The reason that I will use the uh, and if you can divorce it from language, great. The the uh just has a really nice neutral setting at the larynx. And the other one that's tricky is uh of book. And that that's kind of a certain American pronunciation, right? We don't say book, boo, ooh. We say book, book. The American accent has some kind of D -d dopey sounds in it and buh is one but the reason i love it if you can get somebody to just find buh buh oh it's going to set that in so easily and also the b buh buh so try try the b sound in front of some of these buh buh and just just let them rather than thinking a vowel sound Here's what I would do. Do a B, but do the B in slow motion. 
So let the pressure build behind the lips for a little microsecond. B, b, as you're phonating. B. What that B is going to do, place your finger on your larynx and feel this. B. It drops your larynx. B, b, b. And then just let the lips pop and listen to what comes out. What's going to come out is likely enough. B, b, b. And then take that. Don't, don't give them a vowel sound. Just have them think of that. And have them do the B slow. And see if that doesn't pop them into the right place. This is one of those things. There are certain sounds that, that work really, really well for finding the mix. What, what happened? The reason people can't find mix, it is usually because of this acoustic handover. What we have is we have this first resonance that we associate a little more with the throat. And when we want to adjust this resonance, the two levers of this resonance are found at the lips. If we, if we narrow the lips, the value of that resonance goes down. And if we drop the larynx, the throat, right? There's less tension here. It also drops. So this b, b, b is perfect. When people start to go higher and the influence of this first resonance begins to diminish, it feels unstable. So what they do is they try and keep, try and hang on to this relationship of this first resonance, this lowest resonance with the sound wave. And the only way to do that is by doing the opposite, widening the lips and tightening the throat. Ba, 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 ba. And they start shouting. So what mix is, is this allowing of the second resonance to become a bit more dominant. And the second resonance is adjusted by both the throat and the mouth, but also the hump of the tongue. The tongue starts to be important. And when first doing this, it just feels unstable. So when they're first finding mix, just let it be light. Even if it's a falsetto-ish sound, it's okay. You can start to reintroduce intensity and vowel tuning with, with the tongue and getting into that those deeper areas um, later. But at first, they just have to get used to the feeling of allowing this first resonance to stand down. It's just got to back off. And, and the best way to do that, I found, is through the uh vowel, through the uh vowel. Um, so try that B. Let me know how that B sound works. Yeah, Peggy, ask me about that spray. It's, it's crazy. I've got it sitting. I've got it. I actually used it this morning. And for the, the life of me, it starts with a C. And I, I can't think of it. <laughs> but... They will use it. It has been shown to actually help um, reduce um, scarring on the vocal folds or, or help reduce, um, if not scarring, um, uh, nodules. I don't know if it's, the evidence is completely there, but there have been some studies that look at it, but I will, I will get that to you. Do I have any tips for dealing with tongue tension? Um, Hillary. Yeah, so... Tongue tension is really what really fascinating to me because tongue tension is a problem, but tongue tension has become a a bit of a as they say a boogeyman. It's it's being blamed for a lot of problems, and what people do is when they see tongue tension, tongue tension is also like high larynx. And people think, oh, if my larynx is high, it's wrong. And not necessarily. And if there's, there's tension in my tongue, it's wrong. Well, not necessarily. How much tension and what is the tension doing is the tension under your control. So if we are really trying to, and most tension is, as I was just talking about, trying to pull up that first resonance, just squeezing and tensing that first resonance, so we get that and everything just tenses up. But the answer, and this, this is a good answer for a short period of time um, or a certain period of time, is to 
really relax the throat and really relax the tongue. So again, but the throat is going to have to start becoming engaged. It is that where we talked about before this narrowing. So we got to start bringing in a little bit of that hair, yeah, that twang. Also, that next highest resonance, that second resonance becomes vital in mix, becomes vital when we're, we're going to belt or sing intensely. So the tongue needs to become activated. The back of the tongue will start moving back to assist in some of that narrowing. The further back it goes, the darker the sound. Uh, but but there, we want to have a certain amount of that. So we want to activate the back of the tongue, the hump of the tongue. Remember the tongue, the tongue is not just one muscle. It is, it's a number of muscles that move independently. It's very, very unique. Our tongue is like an elephant's trunk and you can move parts of the tongue independent of each other. Very unique structure. And it's very important in singing. So the tongue starts to be more in this position. Ken Bozeman, um, who's a wonderful voice educator, Ken Bozeman has these uh, exercises where he just works the tongue. E -A -A -O -O, and he does it on this whisper. Where the tongue is activated, it's not. You want to find these high pitches. And then you can start to work that. He, he, you know. My tongue is here. notice I'm not I'm not flipping as I go to my higher register it's not falling apart right it's not belting but it's it's holding together and it's not pure falsetto and so that starts building to a stronger sound so you want you want to activate the tongue so don't don't view tongue tension you know it's funny because I, I will I will tell people look Singing without tension is called silence. There has to be tension in the system. If I if I pick this up, right, I don't want to squeeze this. Imagine this is a a, um, a cardboard paper cup, right? I've got a to-go cup of coffee. If I squeeze this, I'm going to compress the cup and it's going to spill coffee all over me. But if I don't have a certain amount of tension, I'm going to drop it and the coffee is going to go all over the floor. That control is what we want within our voice system. And we have tension at the velum, right? The velum, soft palate lifts, right? We have in the back of the throat, right? The back of the tongue, the, the, the throat itself, the vocal folds need to close, but we don't want excess tension at the folds, yeah? But look, if I'm going one, 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 that's in a different amount of tension then. One, 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 right? But I don't want, I don't want to squeeze it. So it's, it's working all of these things. So that's a, it's a, that's a very long convoluted answer to say. And, and I'm, I'm speaking to everyone, not just you, perhaps you, you're aware of this, but, but be careful about overdoing wanting a lack of tongue, tongue tension. I also see this with low larynx. Because when somebody is, is straining and they're yelling, they have a high larynx, right? Because part of pushing that first resonance, resonance too high is really squeezing at the throat and shoving the larynx up. So they will work low larynx exercises. Uh, things like... Which is wonderful, right? The larynx is stable. It removes the tension. You can't belt that. Because now that first resonance is really low. And when it's too low, everything just gets weak. So we can start bringing the larynx back up. And you can sing things with a higher larynx. Right? It's this um, Jeremy, Jeremy Ryan Mossman. Show me this. I, I love this. He's a fantastic voice educator as well. 
but he was really getting this really twangy, right, with a high larynx. And then he starts to wave, wave through a window, right? So it's, it's really finding that high larynx. And, and your larynx, if you try and do that at a really low larynx, I can't do it. Because what I've done is I've pulled the resonances too low. The tongue is vital in tuning resonances. The larynx is vital. The lips are vital. The whole apparatus is vital in tuning resonances. And, and the secret to singing, once you get past phonation coordinations, the secret of great singers is they can tune these resonances. It's resonance tuning. Resonance tuning takes the sound wave created by the vocal fold and, and filters it and gives you tone quality, gives you vowel perception, gives you intensity, gives you all of these things. So if we just over relax the whole vocal tract, we're no longer vowel tuning. We've, we've dropped the resonances too low. So when we're first trying to sing, the resonances are too high and we're yelling. We go through a period where we drop everything really low so we can get the vocal folds able to, to phonate and get the coordinations. But then we've got to bring back in vowel tuning and, and, and we start to step into a certain amount of good tension. So um, just be aware of that. That, that. that to me, you want the secret of singing, it's vowel tuning, it's the acoustics. The acoustics are absolutely vital. That's why um, my course, The New Science of Singing, that, that course, I just, I go into acoustics in depth in understanding how they, how they affect your voice, how they function, how to control them. The acoustics are fascinating. We don't know everything about them. Even the greatest minds in voice, the researchers will argue about what's happening. It's endlessly fascinating, but that, that really is a secret. Um, Aaron, you are so welcome. Let me see. So hopefully uh, that helped Hillary. Are any good exercises to develop your dynamics? Yeah, more support means louder. When I go quiet, I lose support. What to work on? So, Stewie, uh, so what's happening? And, you know, this is also, it also depends on your voice type, right? And a more robust lower voice type in when they're singing higher notes. The, the voice is under more tension for pitch. So, Sometimes those, those shifts are a little more dramatic. But what I would do when you're working on dynamics is do them in your lower register to maybe just under that first transition if you're having trouble with those. And um, work on softer sounds, but not breathy. So you can, you know. Coo, 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 coo. Right now, coo, 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 and then just a little more and practice this. Mmm, mmm. You want to just develop that touch of resistance. Mmm, mmm, mmm. And it feels like you're pressing down, mmm, rather than huh, pressing up. Coo, 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 coo. So you can feel them more. Ooh. Then what you start doing is you do a little press, and then you open the vowel a little bit. Coo 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 coo. As I go to coo rather than coo, I start increasing the energy on the higher frequencies, the higher parts of the sound wave. Coo 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 coo. And then I'll open the vowel a little more to a different vowel. Coo go go go. Back to coo, 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 Play with that in the lower register. Your your dynamics are going to be, there's two parts to it. It's how much, it's how long the closed phase is within phonation. Phonation is the opening and closing of the vocal folds. The longer they stay closed, the longer the period of energy that is created in your vocal tract. It's when the vocal folds are closed that we have energy. Because what that does is when you close, there's an immediate drop in pressure. And old plumbing, you will hear this. Water's running, you shut off the tap and you hear, kunk, kunk, 
because the, the energy of the water suddenly, bam, it slams. And then, part, and then after that slam, there's a drop in pressure of, of the water as it's, as it's leaving. So this sound wave at this air, when we shut it, all of a sudden, there's a drop in pressure in the vocal tract. So the higher pressure of the atmosphere will rush in. And then that, as it rushes in, becomes compressed, which raises the pressure even higher, which then it pushes out and you get this back and forth. As long as the vocal folds are closed, that's happening. When they open, that is actually, it drops. You start to experience equilibrium in the flow of air. So the energy diminishes. So what you're doing in this means you're increasing the closed phase. You're increasing the amount of energy. By opening the vowel, by changing the vowel, you start then tuning into higher resonances. You're giving these higher resonances more energy. And these higher resonances, by giving them more energy, they vibrate more quickly and die out faster, right? So the lower parts of the sound wave are slower. Ooh, they live to the next closed uh, event. Ooh, but the high frequencies, if I'm not giving them energy, ooh, they die away. No matter how much I press, ooh, we don't get that. We don't get that louder energy. I need. Oh, now I'm starting to get those higher frequencies involved. So there's there's more energy involved as well. And you can feel this. If you do a hoodie gee, gee, do a really dopey gee, gee, and then try and make it louder, gee, gee, without losing the dopey quality. You can't. You actually have to gee, change the acoustics of it to excite the higher frequencies. So there's there's two parts to um your dynamics there's the vocal folds and there's also the acoustics the vowel so hillary you feel you feel tongue tension all day okay so what i would do is i would do things where i specifically work the tongue and i start increasing tongue awareness and what you can do is just go ahead and you know sometimes tapping can help right here right because the tongue extends all the way down in here this is your tongue so we just think of the tongue as this the tongue is all of this all of these muscles so just kind of tapping that area and letting it relax and feel your tongue relax and then move the tip of your tongue out gently close it close your teeth and swallow and you'll feel the back of your tongue tense for the swallow but the front of your tongue can stay relaxed and then start to move the back of your tongue back and then to neutral and you can you can do Kermit the frog or Ah, I used to use Pee Wee, poor Paul Rubens. Uh, he was so fantastic. We lost Paul Rubens recently, but ha 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 ha. Do like Pee Wee Herman, if that's a reference for you. Ha 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 ha. And then do neutral tongue. Ha 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 ha. Feel your tongue relaxed and feel your tongue in good tension. Yeah. And you can do things of move, press your tongue out. And then back in. Tongue out, back in. And just do tongue exercises. Tongue exercises are wonderful. Um, it's probably something I should do a tongue workout um, for people. But yeah, um, just, just start doing that. Neutral, relaxed tongue, and then do a very specific motion. Start. It's funny. We have this huge muscle right in the middle of our mouth that we use all day long. Use it for speaking. We use it for swallowing. and But our awareness, our connection to it is a little fuzzy. So you can work on increasing that connection. What is the science behind doing scales in a robotic sound? So um, that's a great question, Jeremy. I'm not familiar with that exercise. Um, I should ask Jamie. But um, I... I'm sorry, I don't know. 
doing things in a robotic sound. This is, I may be totally wrong, but if you are talking like a robot, if that's the sound, this is accomplishing a couple of things. First of all, when I go to talk like a robot, what do I do? I increase the higher frequencies, right? I'm getting a little more twang in the voice, but I'm also instantly thinking legato. Because old school robot voices, they didn't separate. Everything was like right here. And I will work students on, um, had a student one time and he had never sung before. And I started working him exercises and he got amazingly good at the exercises. But when he went to go to a song, and I remember he wanted to sing your song by Elton John, and he would go, it's a little bit funny. And so I would have him like a robot. It's a little bit funny. That's feeling. It's a little bit funny. Suddenly I'm thinking like a robot. This feeling inside. Now I'm thinking legato. And so I, I see very definite advantages there but I may be getting the exercise wrong. Um, thank you again for spending time with us and answering our questions. You are very, very welcome. Um, yeah, Stewie, so projecting the sound. This is one of those terms <laughs> that kind of has a fuzzy definition, right? Projecting the sound. What does projecting the sound mean? And for most people, the first thought is to yell. But that's not really projecting the sound. So projecting the sound usually means more volume. When someone says you're not projecting, that means we can't hear you. But rather than raising the volume, I view projecting the sound as better acoustic tuning, better valve tuning, right? So I had an actor come to me and he was actually, or still is, very, very well-known character actor. Um, I never saw the show. I know it's going back away. He played, he was one of the main characters on Doogie Howser with Neil Patrick Harris. He was um, an older doctor. But, but great actor, just, just wonderful. And he was doing a play in Los Angeles. And he had to yell the word stop. And when he yelled this word, and he had to yell this word, it was, it was, a, it was a big climax in the play where his character, he was actually playing uh, president. President, I believe, Woodrow Wilson. It was Wilson or Truman? Oh my gosh, I feel so bad because I saw the play. Anyway, um, but the, he finally loses his temper and he was just screaming, stop, stop. So what I had him do is pronounce it, stop. So he went, stop. Now that, that doesn't cost me anything. Stop. That voice projects. I can even do it with less intensity. Stop! And it's still loud. Stop! Because it's a higher pitch, but I'm doing stop. It's more vertical rather than out the mouth. So when you're projecting, what you want to do is you want to bring out more energy in the higher frequencies. When you're yelling, you're, you're using a lot of energy. And it's loud, but it's loud here. And being loud here is not as impactful to the ear as being loud here. I use the example of an entire orchestra is blasting. I get this from my first voice teacher, Eric Buter. It's one of the first things, he told me this in my first lesson. He said, an orchestra is blasting. Every instrument's going. The percussionist with the triangle goes, ding, and you hear it over all the brass, everything. Why is that? Because those high frequencies, they have, they travel faster, they lift up and over, and they hit a more sensitive part of the ear. So to project, it's, it's just better tuning of acoustics. It's not necessarily singing louder. 
So I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it, it, Stewie, dynamics, think of it in terms of vowels and, and think about how you are doing the vowel, how you're utilizing the vowel. It's, it's incredibly important. Um, if a vowel, if the vowel tuning is putting all the energy here, you're going to work very, very hard. It will be loud, but it's not going to be loud in the most pleasing way. It's going to cost you, and it's not as loud as something that has better acoustics. You can feel if you're being relaxed, if you put your finger under your chin. Yes and no. He, cause, cause look, if, if I'm, if I'm saying, uh, if I'm belting, he, he, right? Everybody's doing that. She's running out on TikTok, right? This, he, if I relax everything, he, he, there, there is a certain amount of tension. So it, it depends on what it is you're doing. The tongue is activated. Hey, where, as Carrie Obert says, you can have tension anywhere, but right there at the vocal fold. That's where you don't want to feel the tension. So I will visualize this, this um, pyramid, right? He, he, rather than he, 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 he. It's there. And, and, and that is not without some tension. What are my thoughts on vocal slides? Are there benefits? Absolutely. I, it, th this has been asked now a few times. And it seems to maybe there's some controversy. I don't know. There is, there is, there are some who want to be contrarian. Look, the quickest way to gain an audience, social media knows this, I'm not, I'm not going to go on a diatribe, but to be confrontational, to agitate, that's a very strong human emotion. And if you want to come on the scene and say, everything you know is wrong, everything you've ever heard is wrong, Here's why everything else is wrong. Here's why this voice teacher is wrong. Man, you'll get some eyeballs. That, that, that's clickbait. I'm not immune to it. But, and I'm, I know I'm going off on a tangent, but I just want you to be aware that as you're out there gaining vocal information, right, there's a certain amount of vocal information that is free. And if something's free, then what's the product? You. So when I when I'm doing these, right? And and I do my podcast, I do these Q&As. My part of my hope, well my my general hope is that you you find value and that I help you. But also maybe you'll go download the free copy of my book Beginning Singing. You'll click that link. And maybe you'll read that book and you'll find some value in it. And then at some point, you might consider some of the things that I have for sale. So I'm building an audience. Yeah, and even if you never do that, I'm, I'm happy to help. But you have to understand when, when stuff is free and people are out there saying things, there's also some marketing involved. And so marketing can fall into hyperbole. I mean, that's you, you've got to kind of push people to make a decision. So... I don't know where this slides are no good things come from. I I really I I I instantly pull back when somebody says this never works because I will use the word never or I rarely find that to be true. Slides are wonderfully valuable, right? Just warming up. Oh. Uh, uh, what 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 is wrong with that right glides slides they're wonderful first of all you're not worried about hitting notes now hitting notes obviously is something we need to do but when you're just warming up 
or when you're a newer singer, pitch accuracy and worrying about pitch can sometimes be to our detriment because we get so caught up in it that the body, if we feel that we're not specifically nailing the pitch, the body will compensate. And when the body starts to try and compensate outside of our control, when the when our, our nervous system starts to do things, it usually does. And so somebody is trying to mum, 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 and they're worried about the pitch, mum, mum, if they just they can start to work the voice through that sequence of notes, that range without, without worrying about that and everything can kind of calm down. So gl sirens, glides, it's not the only thing you can do, right? But it's, it's a great tool. So, so hopefully that helps. Oh, um, Stewie, uh, yeah, my rant. So my latest podcast, and if you want to listen to my podcast, look, I'm going to tell you right now, here's a little secret. I, I, first of all, I don't hold anything back, right? So I'm not holding anything back on anything I do for free. It, it, there, there seems to be this myth. Maybe there are voice teachers who do it. I haven't seen them where, I actually can think of one person, but where, they only give you a little bit of knowledge and then they're just trying to hold it all back. I don't do that. Most voice teachers I know, they, they really, really share. I, I give you everything I know about the voice on my podcast, The Intelligent Vocalist. Um, I'd love it if you become a listener. The latest episode, I go into a rant and I, 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 I kind of had to think hard before I did that because I, I don't like to rant, but... Yeah, there are some there there are some negative um, people in the industry that like to attack other voice teachers, and and that is that is something that that just drives me mental. And I will just say right here, the thing that really drives me super mental is this, and I understand why they think that this is a good idea. But people that just want to challenge a voice teacher, hey sing something. I want to hear you bust out this really hard song. If you can't sing on this level, I don't want to hear from you. Some of the very best educators I know have vocal paresis. They have neurological conditions. They, they've had one brilliant voice teacher I know suffered a stroke from going to the chiropractor. So these are voice teachers that can't demonstrate the way other people do, but are at the very top of the game when it comes to imparting knowledge, to leading people to vocal balance, to getting results out of their students. So what do you want? Do you want to get results? Do you want, do you want your voice? Right? I know we compare the voice to other instruments, right? A guitar player, but, but I had the, I studied drums and I studied with one of the world's best drummers. And then I studied with the world's best drum teacher. This was a drum teacher who Neil Peart of Rush took a year off to study with. And this person didn't really play very well, but he was brilliant. He could get amazing results out of everyone. Steve Smith, the drummer from Journey studied with him. My God, I'd be at my lesson. I had George Harrison's drummer was there. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix's drummer, Mitch Mitchell was there at one of my lessons. It, it, it was incredible. So you've really got to ask, do, do you want results or do you want somebody who sings well? Now I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive, but they're people who, who will state that they are. And so what you have, you have these people, it's kind of a form of bullying and you have brilliant voice teachers who you don't hear from, who don't go out and do this who won't put themselves out there because they don't want to deal with the bullying. And it's, it's you know what? It's to everybody's loss. So th there's another one of my rants. Another question. Um, I sing in Brazilian Portuguese. Brazilians hold these nasal sounds. They don't know how to do it. 
Yeah, I don't um it's like it's like French, yeah? Where you get the uh vowels. And some of that look, these can be very, very effective exercises. So you can take a nasal sound. That's completely through my nose. And the way I know is mm, mm, mm. that's how you can tell if you're nasal. If you think you sound nasal, look, singing like this, that's not nasal. Because like I can still make the sound, but I can't. It's a higher larynx. It sounds kind of nasal, but it's not nasal. But do a nasal sound. Completely nasal, right? Your tongue is up against the soft palate. And then Drop the tongue slightly. So you go between completely nasal and just, and then drop the tongue ever so slightly. So it's still very nasal. Well, that's tricky. I got to work that one. Haven't done it in a while. And then start to drop the tongue a little more, a little more, a little more, and play back and forth. Um, that's something that you'll, that you'll want to work. So, hey everyone, that, uh, that hour went quickly. I want to thank you all for attending. Thank you so much. I will do this again next week. Um, so, same time next week. Again, we will talk soon. Thank you for the great questions. Bye-bye.